Good evening and welcome. My name is Larry Parnas, and I'm the editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette. One week from now, and one hour, the polls will close in Northampton for its municipal election. Tonight, our purpose is to help inform the choice that North Northampton voters will make next Tuesday when they select a new mayor. On behalf of the Gazette and its co-sponsors, I extend our thanks to the candidates for coming out yet again near the end of a vigorous contest that has seen upwards of a dozen forums. If you're a political junkie, this is your year. Year, sorry. And if you love winter, apparently it's also your year. Uh, these candidates really need no introduction at this point, but they're going to get one anyway, briefly. Uh, Michael Bargley and David Narkowitz. In alphabetical order, here are their vitals. Mr. Bargley, 62 is a former 16-year member of the Northampton City Council in both ward and at-large posts, including eight years as its president. He was a candidate for mayor in 2009. He retired as a teacher, school guidance counselor, and administrator from the Amherst Public Schools. He serves as organizational coordinator of the Dementia Initiative, a community program that connects people with dementia and their caregivers with services. He also serves as a mentor at the Hampshire County Jail and House of Correction working to help inmates acquire skills that will help them become successful citizens upon release. Mr. Narkowitz, 45, is a six-year member of the City Council in both ward and at-large posts. He has served as the City Council President since January 2010 and became acting mayor September 9 when former mayor Claire Higgins resigned to take a job in the nonprofit sector. He's a 12-year board member of the Northampton Education Foundation and has served as its co-president. He also formerly served on the city's zoning board of appeals and transportation and parking commission, of which he was once chairman. If you'd like to know more about their backgrounds, visit GazetteNet or Northampton Media or WHMP's podcasts or visit the candidates' websites. We'll get started right after some brief housekeeping. I'd like to introduce the panel, left to right, Stanley Moulton, is the managing editor for online at the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Mary Serez is the founder of Northampton Media. Bob Flaherty is the host of the morning show on WHMP Radio. And Lori Loisel is the managing editor for print at the Gazette. The program tonight is spelled out on cards available at the door. I suggest you pick one up. But for those who are watching at home or on streaming vid uh, video anywhere, uh, a quick recap. We're going to begin with, question, with a question from a Gazette reader, move into panelists' questions, then invite the candidates to pose questions to each other. They'll do, we'll do two rounds of that. And then we'll have a long segment for the latter part of the evening where we invite uh, members of our audience here to write questions for the candidates and put them in the basket by the door. We will collect those questions at about the midpoint of the evening after the panel questions are complete. Uh, the questions will be selected by Lori Loisel and myself based on uh, seeking to uh, reach a variety of topics and issues and to avoid repetition. So please have your questions in the basket by the end of the panelists' questions and uh, include your name and screen. Okay, we tossed a coin to decide who will go first or last in the closing statements. Uh, Mr. Bartley won that toss and elected to go last. Time is tight. Please save your applause for the end. And at this time, also turn off your phones or silence them. And we'll go on to the first question. The event hosts tossed a question in advance, or tossed a coin in advance, and tossed the questions here tonight. And the first to respond will be Mr. Bardsley. Uh, this question comes, to, uh, comes from Nora Sims Roach of Northampton. And it will be to both candidates, and they each have two minutes to talk. And here's the question. We've talked a lot about the need for affordable housing. But how well do you think the city is taking care of the affordable housing that it already owns? Are we doing an adequate job of keeping our public housing safe, clean, and comfortable? If not, what needs to change? Two minutes to Mr. Barton. Well, first of all, thank you, Larry, and thank uh, all the panelists for tonight's forum. Um, if I heard the question correctly, it was the, um, 
the affordable housing that the city owns. Is it already out? But I'm, I'm going to look at that as the, uh, the affordable housing within the city. Because um, I think uh, technically the city doesn't own the, uh, the public housing for the North Hampton Housing Authority. Um, affordable housing, I think we need to look at the, the full range of it. And um, there is a lot of the affordable housing um, that I am familiar with through the North Hampton Housing Authority. There's a, a lot of problems and a, a lot of issues that have to be addressed. And I think um, in many cases, um, there are concerns with the residents there around um, issues that could impact their health and their safety. So I think there's a lot more that could be done uh, within uh, the city on a whole range of issues that affect, affect affordable housing. Uh, one of the things that has occurred over the last two years since I've been off the council is I still have been getting phone calls from residents who live in affordable housing looking for someone to be an informal citizen's advocate for them. And I have done that on a number of occasions. So not only do we have to look after the affordable housing units, we have to look at after the people who are living in those units. And I think a lot of them feel like their voices haven't been heard and that they don't have um, other uh, means of uh, re uh, redress of their grievances. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area. Yes, so um, we do, uh, we have several types of affordable housing. Indeed, the Northampton Housing Authority is one of the major ones that's actually run by, a, by an independent agency, though the city, the mayor, does appoint people to a commission uh, that, that helps oversee and make policy there. Uh, we also have uh, um, helped to work with um, private developers, such as the Valley CDC, which helps to develop a lot of affordable housing in the city, as well as working with Habitat for Humanity, where we've provided funding. But again, Habitat does the actual development process, and then the end user ends up owning the home. Um, so there's different classes of affordable housing within the city. Uh, we do, I, we obviously, as a city councilor for Ward 4, I represented folks in McDonald House, and as an at-large counselor, I've represented residents all around the city, and you know, as a counselor, have helped to work with them when they have particular issues, but most of it has been to plug them into the Northampton Housing Authority and try to get whatever issues are resolved. In terms of the money that we don't actually put city money into the Housing Authority, because that's all funded by, uh, they get funding from HUD uh, and from other uh, agencies, but not directly from the city budget. Um, we do own the Grove Street uh, Shelter, which uh, is operated by uh, uh, ServiceNet, and we've made some capital improvements there. We also have a housing partnership in the city, which does a great job of really looking at the full landscape of our public housing, what's available, whether it's in the uh, SROs, whether it's in uh, family housing, um, and they uh, make recommendations and sort of give the city kind of the state of affordable housing, and that includes not only the physical state of it, but the available stock that we have. Um, so as, as mayor, I think one of the things that we have to do is to, is to look at the reports that we receive from the affordable housing uh, folks um, and, and also work with the agencies that run that housing to make sure that it is kept safe, it is kept, uh, it is kept um, in good repair, and that it's a healthy environment for people to live in um, and, and try to stay on top of that. Uh. <clears throat> Do either of the candidates want to take response time to that particular question? It's not. Okay. Moving on to the panel now. The first question will be to Mr. Barsley, posed by Stan Bolton. It's a two-minute response to the question, and then Mr. Narkowitz has one minute, and that's the format for all of these questions. Two minutes to respond, one minute to uh, answer by the other candidate. Michael, your opponent is a former district aide to Congressman John Olver and has worked in Washington on the congressional staffs of other congressmen. How do you match that experience at a time when it's critical for any mayor to look regionally or even nationally for creative solutions to economic and other challenges facing the city? Well, first of all, that experience was uh, a number of years ago. It is not an immediate experience. So in terms of relationships there and uh, the networking that you referred to and even uh, familiarity with some of the agencies, um, a lot has, has changed over 10, 15 years. So that's what would be one of my uh, uh, first observations on that. 
Um, also, the, in terms of the, the networking that needs to be done or the relationships, um, I have had uh, very uh, solid working relationships with uh, congressmen, uh, with a uh, state rep, with a uh, state senator. So I don't think I'm in, in, handicapped in that area. I think I have developed those relationships. I've worked with those people. I've helped all those people get elected um, early on. So I think uh, in terms of having working relationships and having that kind of partnership with the state government or the uh, federal government, uh, I, I'm not concerned that that's a disadvantage in my case at all. So um, I will provide the local leadership necessary to establish working relationships there. I also think it's a, uh, a benefit these days to be, um, have a, uh, be considered a fresh face when it comes to dealing with some of the, the, the national uh, political issues. A lot of people are very skeptical of some of the uh, people who are inside it. I have never aspired to be an insider or someone who is a, uh, a professional going to Washington. So. This is my home. This is where my commitment is to stay here. I'm, I'm not looking forward uh, for any other office other than uh, the one being here in uh, Mr. Nair, what's responsible to one minute? Yes, yeah, so uh, I, I um, was, did work in Washington as a congressional aide, so it's a lot of my uh, policy background and budget background is built on that. Um, but I've sort of moved my way down to the local level. I then worked here in, in Western Mass for John Olver as his economic development advisor. And I think a lot of that experience is, is very applicable to the job of mayor because a lot of the work that I did was in cities and towns, was working with mayors, was working with uh, companies and businesses and organizations. And I really tried to use that experience as a counselor working on these kinds of issues. Uh, and I've also continued to play a role in terms of working with uh, our state reps. I'm proud to have the endorsement of state rep Peter Kokot. Uh, we've had a great working relationship. Worked with Stan Rosenberg. He's actually with our congressman today looking at some of the storm damage and had a good relationship working with him. Um, I've also been a leader on state issues. I've, I've lobbied on behalf of the city. I've part of, uh, formed a, a statewide organization uh, to work on product sustainability issues to sort of to push for recycling and advanced uh, measures to do with product sustainability. So that's not uh, the next question will be posed to Mr. Narkowitz by Mary Sreed, so we're going to meet it. Um, Mr. Narkowitz, uh, former Mayor Claire Higgins once said, there will always be the 35% who will never vote for me. And your opponent, in addition to characterizing you as Higgins' heir apparent, describes a group of voters who are still feeling angry and disaffected by the Higgins administration. Have you found it challenging to attract these voters to your cause? Is their anger with the Higgins administration justified or even relevant in this campaign? Uh, well, in terms of uh, in terms of my approach to running for this uh, job, I feel like we have an opportunity for a new mayor for the first time in 12 years. I've approached it uh, as somebody who's applying to all the citizens of Northampton for that job. I've gone out all across the city and met with people in every ward and every neighborhood. Um, I have people supporting me from all across Northampton. Uh, and I basically have focused on uh, what are we going to do to move the city forward. We, we have a great city, but we have a number of challenges, whether it's in the budget, whether it's trying to keep our, our city affordable and livable. Um, and I've really tried to reach out and build a broad-based uh, support in the city. And I think if, uh, if you looked at the folks who are supporting me, if you've been to events, uh, they've been really well attended, and again, by a cross-section of the city uh, that have come out. Uh, because I think they, they appreciated that approach to not only the way I run my campaign, but how I would view the role of the mayor, which is to be the mayor for the entire city. Um, so, again, I, I, I understand that people um, want to look at Mayor Higgins and want to talk about that, um, but, and, and obviously we, I uh, have, have discussed that throughout the campaign, but what I've tried to discuss more about is where are we going to go in the future? What, what are we going to do moving forward? Uh, what are the challenges that we have right now, and how are we going to address them? What are the things we're going to do? Um, and I think that's, I think everyone in the city uh, shares a lot of those same concerns, shares the same values in terms of uh, lo loving this community and wanting to make sure that it remains financially sound, that, that it remains a place that people can live and work, uh, and run businesses, and raise families. So, yeah, I, I, that's, that's my response to that issue. Uh, one minute, Mr. Parsons. Um, 
Yes, there are people in, in the city who are angry over uh, uh, one issue or, or another, but th that anger, I think, it, it, it's really you're mischaracterizing that anger to say it was um, anger directed at one person or an anger or even over a difference of uh, political uh, uh, ideology or uh, perspectives. A lot of people were angry about how things were done um, about it, or how things were not addressed. And it was really around certain issues and the feeling that they weren't being heard. And so I think that's the anger that um, existed. And a lot of times there have been ways to kind of dismiss that and say, you know, angry people. But if you look at the events of um, Occupy uh, Wall Street, um, angry people have uh, stepped forward, people with anger have stepped forward and expressed their discontent with the status quo and the way things are uh, going. So to me, the issues that I've been listening to for the last two years is reflected in that. Thank you. Okay, the, next, the next question is to both candidates. It's from Bob Clary, new WHMP. Each candidate will take two minutes to respond and then there will be a minute of, of level of response. Um, by this time, voters have a pretty um, a good idea where you both stand on most of the issues. I think the electorate needs to know a little bit more about their candidates and how they came to be. So I'm going to ask you, who are your heroes, political or otherwise, who helped shape your character and uh, made you who you are today? Uh, so the first to respond would be uh, David. Well, I've talked a lot about in the campaign about sort of my upbringing fact that I grew up in a large, you know, working class family right here in Western Mass. Uh, and my mom and dad were, you know, neither of them were college educated. Um, they were both uh, the, the children of immigrants. Um, and they really instilled in me and my brothers and sisters a, a strong ethic about uh, not only hard work, but also getting involved in the community. Uh, and so my mom was, you know, stay-at-home mom with nine kids, but she always was involved, whether it was a town meeting, whether it was serving uh, uh, on city boards, those kinds of things. And so that really, I think, set me on a path in terms of getting involved, whether it was you know, joining the military and serving the Air Force, uh, uh, the work that I've done in Washington at the local level here in the community. So my parents certainly would be uh, one of my heroes. Um, in terms of, of mentors, as I've moved my way through uh, my adult life, um, certainly um, I've had great uh, teachers throughout my life. Uh, whether it was uh, folks in high school, in my high school, who, who really got me engaged in history and government, whether it was professors in college that I still maintain contact with to this day, and some of them have even supported me in this campaign, uh, to then people that I've worked for, like John Olber, who was mentioned earlier. Uh, he was somebody who really taught me a lot about uh, the, you know, serving people, working on behalf of people, um, really uh, digging in and caring about issues and trying to figure out solutions to, to them. Uh, so I, those, are the, those are the folks who've been kind of the mentors and, and inspiration for me uh, and really are responsible for why I'm here today. Mr. Um, probably a variety of heroes. A, a, a political hero of mine has to be uh, Javi Milk and his uh, facing the challenges that he did uh, back in uh, San Francisco running as a uh, an openly gay man and as being the first openly gay um, elected official in Northampton, um, I often have looked towards him as an inspiration and a hero. Um, I, on a local level, somebody who was an inspiration and hero of mine is a woman named Melanie Kasparian. She was the uh, president of the Teachers Association in Springfield, was uh, dissatisfied with the leadership of the statewide association, and ran and challenged the, uh, the, the status quo uh, leadership of the Massachusetts uh, Teachers Association. And, um, and I was proud to have been her campaign manager at the time. Um, unfortunately, she died a very early death, but uh, Melanie is a, a, remains a hero of mine. Um, when I want, uh, when I'm looking for inspiration, uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. is definitely uh, a hero. Um, uh, another hero of sorts, sorts uh, is my my, uh, my mother. She is a war bride. She came over from England. Uh, she's still alive, very much alive. She's very independent, very tough, very resilient, and, uh, and she certainly is a role model of mine. And 
And another uh, source of inspiration, people that I look to, are my uh, former students, many of whom are still in touch with me, many of whom are helping me out of my campaign, actually. And um, I, I know them, and I know their uh, life stories, and to work with them and listen to them and see them achieve and move forward has been an inspiration to me. Uh, now, not to invite you to challenge your <laughs> hero, but would either of you like to? Doesn't really seem appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question will be from Lori Loisel of the Gazette to Mr. Narkowitz. It's a two-minute with a one-minute response. David, um, Michael Gardsby and many of his supporters have made no secret of the fact that they believe your position as acting mayor gives you an advantage in this election. They've said they believe there was a backroom deal at work on the part of the former mayor. You said on more than one occasion if there was a backroom deal, you got the raw end of it. Um, even if there was no such deal, I think reasonable people might agree that you being acting mayor gives you a bit of an advantage, particularly amid this week's crisis. Um, if you really do believe that it is more of a hindrance to your campaign and in deference to the appearance or reality that it gives you an advantage, um, why didn't you simply resign the council presidency to let the body of the new president and then have a level of playing field in this very important election? Um, I think I said that on one occasion at a debate, uh, one debate. That's not really something that I've said very much throughout the campaign or just when I was asked about it, that was a uh, response. Um, uh, again, in terms of, I've, I've walked through the process of how it occurred in terms of the, the mayor uh, having her own, just making her own decision to resign and, and take another job and then charter as council president for me to take over. Um, you know, in terms of advantages, uh, again, I, I, I've tried to be very respectful of, of the office and, and, and also separate it from my campaign. Um, in terms of the recent events, uh, you know, I'm working on about eight hours sleep in the last three days, so I'm not sure that that has been a great advantage for tonight. Um, uh, I, I'm not really sure that the idea of resigning, um, had I resigned, I th I, the thought crossed my mind, actually. I didn't think about that, but then I also believe that people would say, well, he doesn't follow through on his commitments. He took an oath as a city council president. He took an oath that he knew when he ran for city council and became city council president, that that was one of the obligations that he would have. Um, so I really viewed it as my duty to do it. I think I've tried to carry out the duties very respectfully of the office. Um, I've tried to not have it um, cross over into the campaign. Um, in terms of, uh, again, the events of this week, uh, certainly I have no control over that and the weather. Uh, but again, uh, I, that's the obligation that I have, and I've tried to carry it out to the best of my ability. Um, so that's my response. Mr. Barzi, you have a to respond? Uh, two years ago, I believe, in, in this very same room at the, uh, this very same debate, or the debate that was equivalent to it two years ago, a member of the audience, and it wasn't anybody who I remember, it was anybody uh, I believe that I knew, a woman um, asked the question of the then mayor um, whether or not she planned on um, serving out her full term if elected. And if my uh, memory serves me correctly, there was an emphatic yes that, that um, she would complete her, her term. The reason that question was asked is that there had been rumors and talk and a lot of uh, insider uh, information that, that indeed she wasn't going to fill out the term. So whether or not you know whether there was a, a deal or some insider thing going on, there is has been that perception that there has been a people uh, talking and there had been some plans and that the uh, the mayor was was not planning on for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lori will also ask the next question and it will now go to uh, Mr. Barzit. Two minutes with them on the next part. Michael, when you first joined the North Kansas City Council in 1993, you were one of six new faces on the council in a watershed election mm -hmm. that swept into the office progressive relative newcomers to city politics. You worked with that progressive alliance on a number of issues, including as an organizer for Citizens for JFK, which won an override for the renovation of this school, and in 1995, a key player in the effort to pass a domestic partnership ordinance so unmarried gay couples could register in City Hall. In short, you were once part of the progressive establishment you now criticize. 
many of the houses that have bars and vermeer signs planted on them, ones that vote no on the PO signs and no on the override signs on their front lawns. In addition, we've seen many former supporters leave your campaign, taking their support for you with them. It's likely that many of your supporters now are far more conservative than you ever were, which is the real you. Well, I'm not defined by uh, my supporters. Um, I am defined by myself and my own person. Um, I listen to a wide range of people. I can rec um, uh, recognize and understand a wide range of uh, points of view. When you are elected, you are elected to represent everybody, not just the people who agree with you. So I have, as um, on the council, I have been the person, I have been the counselor who have listened to those with sort of a divergent point of view or listened to those who have disagreed with some of the, of the decisions. And for me to be labeled as sort of the, uh, uh, somebody who has deserted a, a particular position or, or my former values, I think is probably an unfair characterization. But, um, I, I think the key thing in your, your term about the progressive establishment isn't so much the term progressive, but it's the term establishment. You know, this, we're talking politics. We're talking about people who have a vested interest in the way decisions are made and the outcome of some decisions. And I think that is much more what is out of play here than the liberal conservative thing. The liberal conservative framework, I think, is really a distraction what the real issues are. I think the real issue is that of transparency and openness and inclusion, and that goes back. That's why it makes the previous question around the elected, not selected issue um, so relevant to this campaign. This is about opening up city government and involving a wide range of people regardless of their political beliefs. Okay, uh, Mr. Dockwitz, you want to respond? Uh, in terms of uh, you know the way I've approached uh, the time that I've served in elected office, uh, starting as a ward counselor and then, and then running for city councilor at large, I, I've really tried to you know, reach out to the entire constituency that I wanted to represent. So when I was running in Ward Four, I made a point of knocking on every door in Ward Four, really getting out there and trying to talk to everybody, all the all the people that I would potentially represent, um, and again not. Uh, not uh, playing to one constituency or another, but really trying to reach out to everybody. In this campaign, I started really early in the spring and, and got out and knocked on doors in every ward of the city. I've knocked on over a thousand doors. We reached out, canvassing, with phone calls. Really tried to get the pulse of the city and, 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 and get as much input as I can from across the city, and then try to take that information. Hopefully, if I'm elected, with me when I when I uh, the mayor, and try to translate that into. We have positive action and positive change on behalf of the entire city. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Bob Flaherty, and it goes to Mr. Narkowitz, two minutes. Uh, David, you've been called a cheerleader for the city. Uh, your campaign speaks of moving a great city forward. Um, but Northampton is not insulated from urban problems like crime, domestic violence, IV drug use, and others not often talked about. Please identify at least three social problems you see as challenges for the city and what you would do to address them. Sure, yeah, and, and again, the theme about the theme of slogan of my campaign, Moving a Great City, uh, also acknowledges that we have a lot of challenges that we have to face, that we have to work on. In terms of three social issues right off the bat, we're here in JFK tonight uh, where my kids go to school. I think bullying is, a, is, a, is an issue that we have to, to grapple with. Um, we have a great organization called Prevention Coalition, which is a, a coalition of the city, of social service agencies, of law enforcement. I've had a chance to attend some of their meetings. Uh, this is a critical issue that we have to work on and that we have to uh, have zero tolerance for. So I think that's a challenge we're facing. Um, clearly, the issue of uh, keeping the city affordable for people, um, making sure that Northampton remains affordable for people that are on fixed incomes, that are uh, low income, that that have lived there their whole life and now are retiring. I think that's an important social issue that gets to how we create economic opportunity and how we provide services in a more cost-efficient way. Um, and then the third issue is, I think, uh, you know, public safety just generally, uh, keeping our streets safe. Um, we've had a struggle 
particularly over the last several years of tight budgets, of trying to have enough um, funding to be able to keep a fully staffed police force and fire department so that we can respond when crises occur. Um, and certainly that's been tested over the last several days where we've had just a record number of emergencies and 911 calls and had to respond to those. Um, so I would think those are at least three issues that I want to work on uh, and I've worked on as a, as a counselor and I believe I have a record of trying to advance those issues. So those, those would be the three that I would think of, of, of several. Okay, um, one minute, Mr. Barsley, to respond. Uh, three issues um, in one minute. The, uh, uh, one of the issues that I've been uh, talking about this uh, campaign as well as the last campaign is the struggles of the working middle class individuals and families trying to be able to uh, survive in, uh, in Northampton but also in this country. It's a, it's a national issue and it has been um, uh, raised or highlighted through the whole um, Occupy uh, Wall Street, as well, uh, as well as some other national uh, events. Uh, drugs, I think, is a, an issue that we need to always be mindful of. I think a number of the uh, safety issues um, that we have are often uh, due to uh, drug-related. And uh, the third that we can never uh, um, relent on is uh, discrimination or the, um, uh, the resistance or the uh, for people of who are different, diversity, diversity issues. And I was proud to have found the Human Rights Commission, which has been working on those. So those are three. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is by Mary Ceres, opposed to Mr. Bardsley. Two minutes. Uh, Mr. Bardsley, in your campaign literature, you refer, and I quote, to a small group of entitled insiders who wish to install their hand-chosen successor into the mayor's office. Who specifically are these insiders, and what interests do they represent? What would these purported insiders gain that runs counter to the public interest should David Narkowitz be elected mayor? Please give specific examples. Well, I'm going to resist the temptation, Mary, of naming names, and I think you and I had this conversation already. But um, one thing I will do in terms of specific information is refer to the, um, the finance report that was filed uh, last year in a non-election year, and it shows who made contributions. And usually in Northampton, uh, campaign reports are, uh, reflect very little activity. Um, I think last year, uh, Mayor Higgins uh, raised and spent $1,000. Mine was comparable. Uh, but last year's report for, for David, who allegedly wasn't thinking about running for mayor, he raised over $6,000, which by Northampton standards is a large group, uh, amount of money. And within that, um, virtually all the people who contributed to him, uh, with the exception of uh, family, were um, uh, back as previous backers of Van Higgins. So it, it really looks like, uh, maybe there's another explanation to that, but it really looks like a decision had been made over a year ago about who the candidate was going to be. If you look at the uh, contributors, um, the big money, the deep pockets um, are in, uh, reflected in there. Uh, the people I have been representing uh, do not have deep pockets. Uh, I had to uh, uh, take out loans and do a lot of the funding in my own campaign just to bring the issues forward this year. Uh, people are struggling, I realize that, but there is clearly those who have a um, kind of a vested interest in the direction of the city. I think you can find a, a lot of that evidence in that report that was filed over a year ago. Uh, Mr. Narkowitz, you'd have a minute to respond, to address that? Uh, definitely I've raised uh, money as a candidate, and you know, I'm really proud this, uh, this campaign. I've gotten donations from over 500. I think it's about 525 people have given me donations. Most of them are small donations. I don't know if that's a record in terms of the number of donations um, for, for a mayoral candidate, but I've, I've had support from all over the city in terms of the people supporting me. Um, again, the, the idea that there's a small group installing me, uh, you know, we have, we, I think we still live in a democracy where people get elected and get elected at the polls, and you know, I, I was elected uh, counselor at large by a very large majority of, of the public. Um, I have 
really strong support in every ward in the city. Uh, and, uh, and I've tried to, to build on that as a mayoral candidate and reach out to people all across the city and again try to try to get as many people to support me in every ward of the city. So the idea that uh, somehow a small group is going to decide this election, it's going to be all the people of Northampton. We're going to go to the polls next Tuesday and vote. Um, and that's, that's, that's what I believe this whole election is about. We have one more question from the panel, but I would like to remind people in the audience that uh, this is your last opportunity to write a question down for one of the candidates that we would consider using tonight. And if you have one, it goes in the basket by the front door, and they'll be picked up after uh, Stan Moulton poses a question to both candidates. And this time, the first question, uh, question will go first to Mr. Barzin. I think the Well, we, we did it the other way last time, so we'll just okay. Yes, I'm asking each of you to uh, describe a specific example of how you failed in public life, what you learned from that experience, and how that will make you a better mayor. How I failed in public life. Well, um, what comes to mind, uh, a, a number of the uh, controversial decisions of which, when I was on the council, that we had to, uh, to make. and. Um, of, of those and that I'm thinking of includes the um, expansion of the landfill of the aquifer, uh, the hotel downtown, um, the, uh, the educational overlay district and the expansion of Smith. And all of those became controversial when citizens came forward with their concerns. And they were bringing concerns that um, up until that point in time, the city had not anticipated, or if it did, if they weren't brought forward to the council. Um, they were bringing forward concerns that, uh, <coughs> and information that we didn't necessarily um, address in our deliberations. So I think the, uh, the, it was participating in the decision-making process that wasn't really geared for input from citizens early on. And so if I had to do that over again, I think I would have um, fought a fight earlier on about um, redoing the whole uh, decision-making process. Um, I have, I've been criticized as being too process oriented that was especially at the time. Um, so I was uh, probably a little bit shyer on that than I should have been. But we needed to have a process where people had, um, could bring forward their concerns earlier on and then not wait to react against the proposal that was already up there. And that was a mistake. Mr. Narkowitz, two minutes. Yeah, um, somewhat similar, uh, and again focusing on one of those issues, the, the landfill decision. Um, becoming a new counselor and, and uh, the landfill decision, which had been a process that had been going on for many, many years, decisions that had been made for a long time. And then we were suddenly presented with a scenario or, or told that we had to really, because we were going to be making a zoning decision, that as counselors we really had to refrain from, uh, you know, from the usual stuff that we would do in terms of uh, uh, making public pronouncements or talking to people or, or engaging in a back and forth. Um, we had to really reserve judgment. That was frustrating. We were criticized for it. It was frustrating. It was. It did not. It was frustrating because people were writing emails asking questions about about issues. We could basically say. Thank you for sharing this with me. I'm going to send it to the city clerk so it can be included in the public record of a future you know, zoning application. Um, it was frustrating to me, and at the time I thought about, let's, we should try to change this process. We should really try to like, get out of this box that we've been put in. Um, but I felt at the time, you know, this is, you know, I'm sort of a newcomer here. This is not really, uh, this is a process that's been set up by other folks. Um, eventually, toward the end of the process, I, I finally did Submit, submit a change to the process to say let's change this process, let's mix it around, let's put city councilors where they belong, which is in a policy making process. But by that point, it was it was somewhat late in the process. So I guess my my sort of the, the thing that I would take away from that is um, trusting my instinct and and going forward with recognizing that a process is not correct uh, and to try to make the changes that we can at the beginning. 
so that uh, so that we're not in those kinds of situations. So that people have a clear understanding of the roles of policymakers versus zoning regulators, etc. Um, so I think that would be the example that would stand out for me in terms of if I could do something over, I would have tried to act in earlier to try to change that process. Would either of you like a uh, response time for this question? So that, uh, that completes that segment here tonight. Now we will move on to the part of the event in which the candidates here will ask questions of each other. And um, they will do that twice. They'll have 90 seconds to respond to the question. And then the person who's asked the question can comment for 30 seconds. The first question will be posed by Mr. Bardsley to Mr. Narkowitz. Question and response time again is, is 90 seconds this time. David, as you know, because we served on it together, there was a best practices ad hoc committee, and it issued a report with 10 recommendations. Um, during your tenure as city council president, substantial progress has been made on only one of these uh, recommendations. This was your opportunity to effectively uh, change how the city operates. Uh, what do you account for this bill you to lead? Well, in terms of the best practices report, yes, I did serve on the committee with you. And, and, uh, and when I became city council president, one of the first things I did was try to tackle some of the major ones that were within the city council's purview. Uh, the charter, uh, obviously reforming the charter, reviewing the charter was one of the big ones because that's kind of the framework document for our city government. I sponsored the legislation to create a charter review committee. I appointed that charter review committee. That committee worked and came up with recommendations, and now we have a charter drafting committee that's looking at that. And many of the issues that came up in the best practices process were these kind of large structural uh, issues around term limits, around the structure of the executive versus the legislative branch. The other big issue that I worked on, which was part of that report, was how the city council itself does its business. What kinds of process we have for taking public comment, for how we hold a forum so that people have a better way to give input to the city council, how we structure our meetings. I help workshops with city councilors to try to go over these specific concerns in the report. And then there were a number of issues around how we make city government more open and accessible and how we get information out to each other. And I've tried to work on a number of those as well. I know you're saying that there's only been one that's been worked on, but you can go through the report, and for each of the overarching recommendations, there's a series of recommendations. Uh, do this, do that, consider this. I've tried to go through that report and, and go after all of the low-hanging fruit, all of the things that we can get done in terms of getting the website, making the website more accessible, and all those kinds of issues. So I feel like I've done a lot of work in terms of who's been doing it. I've been the one doing most of that work. Thank you. We'll add a little bit of time here to your response to that. Mr. Barton? Yeah, there are a number of recommendations that have had little or, uh, and in some cases apparently, uh, no progress made on them. Um, there is, for example, the uh, um, a recommendation to have a vision, a mission statement for the city that prioritizes citizen <laughs> engagement and state's ethical behavior. There's another one for a continuing committee to work on the uh, follow-up on the ad hoc um, uh, committee's work. And there's another one to have a uh, review of the Office of Planning and Development. And those are three huge ones that have been very little uh, work has been done on those. Thank you. Okay. The next question would be posed by Mr. Narkowitz to Mr. Bargley, and there's 90 seconds, followed by a 30 second response. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, climate studies over the, over the years, and obviously our recent experience with, uh, with um, storm events, have been uh, talking about the increasing number of, of rain and snow events affecting not only the planet, but also uh, Northampton. Um, in the last 30 years, there, there hasn't been a lot of work done in terms of our aging storm system. Uh, and I wonder um, what your thoughts are on this issue, and uh, if you've given any thought to how the city can look at its infrastructure in this regard as we're dealing with these kinds of major storm events that seem to be hitting us uh, more and more. Well, there's uh, two parts of that. First is making sure that we have plans to deal with uh, major events. Um, a couple of the events, including this one this past weekend, were events that 
uh, could have been a lot worse. And we, um, we did well. Our, uh, our folks who are implement our safety plans did a fantastic job. But if those plans don't uh, cover worst case scenarios, then we're going to be, a, 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 um, be facing a, a situation where we are in trouble. So we need to have planning. The other one is money. We need to come up with money to, that we can uh, address our failing uh, infrastructure. And I have put forward an idea, and as mayor, I will take this idea and make it as a proposal. It is to go um, to the organizations, the nonprofits that currently own property and do not pay property taxes as they're allowed to. And if we can implement a 10% uh, assessment and, and get that, um, according to my work with the assessor's office, that could result in over a million dollars a year to the city. And I would earmark that to deal with our failing uh, infrastructure. It is a huge problem that's coming, that's going to be facing us uh, very, very shortly. Uh, Mr. Darkwitz, you have a 30-second response. Sure. Just, I, I think this is a, a major concern that the city needs to address. Uh, we're currently in a process now where there, there's a, a long-term study that's being done to look at our stormwater system uh, because, again, uh, when we have these increases in rainfall, uh, it's going to continue to be a problem. So I think we do have to look at how we make long-term investments in our infrastructure, particularly this, this uh, stormwater system, uh, which in many year, cases is hundreds of years old, is at capacity, and we're going to have to focus on that as part of our capital plan. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, on to the next round of candidate questions to each other. Um, Mr. Barsley to Mr. Darkman. As I have been saying for, uh, since the, uh, the election two years ago, the working middle class in our city, and I think it's now evidence that in the nation, um, are being severely burdened. Um, a lot of people feel like they can barely make it um, on the income that they have. Um, are you concerned that the average working fam uh, family may look at you as an individual of some privilege and that you did not have to uh, work at a job, and I'm not taking away from being a stay-at-home dad. You mischaracterized uh, my statement several uh, uh, debates ago. It's not taking away from that at all, but for a lot of people, they have to uh, raise a family and work at the same time. Are, are you concerned that working middle class um, folks may have a hard time relating to you and seeing you as a person with a vision? Uh, that has not been my experience during this campaign. Um, again, I've made it no secret when I've run uh, for, for office as a ward counselor and now for mayor that um, I did make the decision, my wife and I did make the decision and, and, um, uh, that I was going to stay home with our kids to be able to raise them. My, both my parents, uh, both of our parents stayed home with us and, and obviously we're, we were, um, uh, uh, felt that that's what we wanted to do and, and we were able to do it. But again, I, I, that, I don't believe that that takes away from my ability to be able to, to relate to parents who are home with kids, parents that are working, uh, relate to people that uh, all across our city from every economic uh, rung of the ladder. Um, we, we, we've, again, my, I've, I grew up in a family where, uh, uh, where uh, my father worked, uh, my mom worked out of the home after my kids, after the kids were, were up and out. Um, and I understand that, that, that it's a struggle, times are tough for people right now, and that we have a lot of challenges. And my focus is going to be on how do we help people address those challenges? How do we uh, create economic growth in the city? How do we uh, keep the city livable and affordable? How do we keep strong public schools? Um, those are the things that I'm going to focus on, and this idea that um, uh, people uh, won't be able to relate to me uh, because I've stayed at home with my kids. I'm not really sure what, what that is, and uh, I'm not really sure how to, how to address that. Michael, you have 30 seconds. If you really thought that that is what I was asking, um, then I think there's, a, there's another issue. What I was asking is that a lot of people cannot afford that. They would love to do it, they cannot afford it. And if you have different levels of income, if you are financially well off, then you're insulated from some of the problems that people face on a daily basis. 
Uh, even people this weekend, people who had more financial resources, had more options to cope with the problems than, uh, than other people. So that is the key. That's the key to the issue, is the, uh, the, your perspective based on your finances. Okay. Mr. Narkowitz, a question for you. Sure. Uh, in our previous debates, we've talked a lot about the, um, the capital spending program. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, and you have said in, in, in those debates that there are, are flaws in the way that we prioritize that spending, that capital spending. And you've mentioned some things about maybe you know, having more city councilors on, the, on it. Um, and, and I'm wondering, are there other specific changes that you would like to make uh, to the capital program? And also, what level of funding do you think we should be putting into the capital program in terms of a percentage of our budget? Um, what, what, what we're spending now versus what we should be spending to be able to make those kinds of long-term capital investments? Well, I think the level of spending uh, depends on uh, the severity of the, uh, uh, the issues that we're facing. I, I think we need to do a, a kind of a rigorous review within each department. We need to hear from more than the, uh, the department heads. We need to hear from other people about concerns and have those prioritized. Um, my, my comment about the uh, need to review the process came in part with the issues that came up during uh, the year where um, there were uh, expenditures that were not necessarily uh, priorities. There was a letter to the editor from the head of the uh, firefighters union who suggested there were some other priorities that were not being addressed and that the expenditures were made on things that were nice but were not required. Uh, there were a similar discussion around the bucket loader which was actually purchased by the city without going through the process. So there's been a number of what I call warnings that the, the, the system wasn't really um, operating smoothly enough and that we need to go back and look at the design. Um, we had discussed previously having another counselor on there um, to represent the council. I think there's uh, other ways of um, uh, affecting the composition of that, uh, that committee. But I would definitely, that is something that needs to be um, examined and considered to be reviewed. Uh, Mr. Narkowitz, 30 seconds. First time. Uh, well, currently the capital program, the capital committee is chaired by a city councilor, is chaired by more than five city councilor David Murphy, and and, uh, and I am concerned about the uh, you know how we balance both our needs right now in terms of providing the services that people need versus the need to make investments in our capital and infrastructure, whether it's buying new plows on a regular schedule, whether it's being prepared to fix roofs, whether it's being prepared to deal with uh, emergency generators that fail, etc. So I think we have to really, as part of our budget process, have a clear understanding of what those investments need to be need to be made. In terms of percentages, we need to make sure we're making long-term uh, investments that are going to be keep us sound for the future. Thank you. Okay, now we're moving on into audience questions, and there are a lot of very great questions. So thanks to all who are here. Um, we will go through as many as we possibly can in the time we have allotted before we, uh, leaving time for the closing statements. Uh, there are a couple of, there are instances in which we will combine some questions when they're very closely on the same topic. Uh, based on the schedule we've set up here in advance, the first question goes to Michael Barsley, and it is this. The effort to keep Meadowbrook affordable occurred while you were council president what role did you play? I do not play a, uh, a leading role in keeping that affordable. Um, as far as um, I can remember is that the mayor took the lead on that issue. I played a uh, supporting role. Uh, but I also played a role in supporting uh, the individuals. As I said, uh, quite often I get phone calls from uh, the residents of those, um, of the various affordable units in the city. And a lot of times those people do not feel they have someone that they can turn to as a, an advocate. So I, I played the, an advocacy role for a number of individuals at that time um, and, and later. Um, but I did not, I was not at the table and the 
with the mayor in terms of uh, negotiating out uh, the settlement. Mr. Narcus, would you like to respond to that? Um, I, again, it's a very specific question about a very specific point in time that I wasn't on the city council, so I'm not really <coughs> sure it's appropriate for me to respond, so I'll pass. Okay. The next audience question goes to you then, sir, and it is this. I was really disappointed you didn't answer the point <coughs> Michael made about big donations before the mayor resigned. Why didn't you answer specifically? Oh, uh, well, in terms of what happened in, in last year, uh, if you also look at that campaign finance report, you'll see that I actually started the year in, in a deficit because I had lent, my, I had basically lent money to, to the campaign because during the two, uh, during the last election, 2009 election, I'd gotten in uh, very late uh, to the campaign, hadn't had raised a lot of money, and ended up putting a lot of money uh, in myself just to be able to be able to supplement some of the things we needed to buy signs. So I lent money to the campaign to be able to do that, a certain amount of money. So in starting the, the, the new year, I wanted to pay off that debt, and I wanted to do some fundraising to pay off that debt. So that was the context, uh, was to be able to raise some money to be able to pay off the debt to the campaign, and be able to uh, to then go forward uh, and have some money to run for re-election uh, in, in the next year, if, I, if that was the decision that I made. So in terms of the, um, raising money, uh, I think candidates have uh, fundraisers in off years. My opponent had a fundraiser yeah, that, that year, last year as well. Um, in fact, I think it was, uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons he stopped being uh, an editorialist for the Gazette, because he held a fundraiser while he was also writing editorials for you. Um, so he did have a fundraiser last year. I had a fundraiser last year. We both raised money last year. Um, candidates raise money um, all the time throughout the election cycle. So that's, uh, that's my response to that. Uh, Mr. Barsley, you have a minute response if you choose to. Yes, um, just to refresh David's memory, he raised uh, $6,175 last year, new funds in addition to what he already had, and the loan that he uh, he used as he, uh, the reason he did that was for $1,500. So he raised considerably considerable more money than he had uh, the loan that he had to pay back for himself. So it is definitely uh, shows the signs of starting a campaign, and a lot of that fundraising uh, was done at the end of the year in uh, December, for example, uh, 1227. Uh, at the end of the year, there was a lot of uh, last minute fundraising, clearly after the loan had been paid back. Okay. Um, we're going to combine a couple of questions here into one that involve uh, one that involves the business community and, uh, and commerce. Uh, and they weren't specified to individual candidates, so we're going to propose them to both <coughs> candidates. Uh, you'll each have two minutes to respond. Mike will go first. Okay. Um, the question begins, I'm a small business owner. Um, please describe... Uh, please describe what the mayor's responsibility is to the business community how will you create jobs or income for small businesses? So that's to both candidates, and it's first to Mr. Barson. One of the things I've done in the past uh, several weeks is I've gone around, I spent uh, two days going around uh, downtown Northampton. I did not meet with every business owner. Um, and I did a similar uh, a day in uh, downtown Florence. And I was listening to the concerns of uh, business owners. Um, they want a lot more visibility from City Hall. They want um, a feeling of connection with their elected leaders. There were, um, I'm particularly, uh, um, I was particularly uh, touched by the story of two business owners that were very, very similar and they ran very different types of businesses. There was one woman who's been running a diner downtown for 16 years, and she said she had never seen the mayor in her establishment. And she even won a regional award, but there was no recognition, no one going down there talking to her. 
Um, her biggest concern when I asked her at the time is that there was going to be a, a jazz festival held on her street. She was afraid her employees wouldn't get access to it. I researched the problem and I found out that uh, the jazz festival had been moved and no one had even communicated that factor. So th there is that feeling of struggle and actual isolation alone. Uh, around the corner there was a high-end um, art store and um, this person again um, had run one uh, recent national recognition, has not seen the mayor or the economic development um, uh, official in his business ever. And again, a concern of disconnected uh, from city government. So I will be a vocal spokesperson for local businesses downtown Florence, downtown Los Hampton. You can count on that. Thank you. Mr. Douglas, two minutes. Yes, uh, I've also been talking to small businesses uh, throughout the city, uh, small business owners throughout the city as part of the campaign. Um, I'm proud to have many of them as my supporters, and, and I do think that the city has to, one of the key parts of what we do in terms of economic development is supporting the small businesses, the businesses that we have already in the city. And that requires outreach, it requires uh, uh, giving them access to services, it, it requires understanding the concerns that they have and recognizing the contributions that they make. Um, I'll tell a story about a, a, a business owner that I've gotten to know over time and, and actually dry cleaners downtown. And she was describing to me a new uh, investment they had made in a new green approach to how they were cleaning clothes, um, which I thought was great. I'd never heard of before. Um, I brought the idea back and, and was discussing it with uh, our city's economic development director and said, let's, we should recognize this business and we should recognize other businesses that are making these kinds of investments. What came out of that was a green business recognition program that we've been doing now for a couple of years, trying to recognize local small businesses that are not only doing a great job running their business, but making investments in their business to make them greener, more environmentally friendly, etc. Um, so I think those are the kinds of things. Also, working, you know, helping them access whether it's small business funding, whether it's loan funding, whether it's trying to facilitate issues around regulatory issues. I think those are the kinds of things that we have to do. Uh, another thing that I've talked about during the campaign is a program called the Business Visitation Program, which we used to do in the city, uh, which was kind of a joint venture with the city, the chamber, um, and business leaders, where on a very regular basis we'd go out into the community and meet with businesses and understand what their operations were, what their concerns were, uh, uh, and, and many times out of those, they, we would learn things about them, they would learn about programs that they didn't know existed, about funding sources that they didn't know existed. So I think it's really important to have that outreach and communication with our small businesses and support them, because they're really the core of our local economy. Thank you. <coughs> would either of you like to exercise that? Well, the program that David mentioned, I've been doing as a candidate. I've been going around and talking to them. I don't think it takes a program to, um, to walk out of the mayor's office and walk down Main Street and talk to the businesses. They want that, that connection. I am very much a, a people person. I will be connected with people. I will uh, listen to them. I will also do programs for employees who work downtown because a lot of those folks no longer feel connected to downtown and they used to be part of the life blood of downtown. So I will do it day one. Thank you, sir. David, do you want to add anything to that? You have, you, have, you have some response time if you'd like to uh, add to no, that. Other than to say, again, I, I, I spend a lot of time in local businesses. I, I, I've done that. I've represented downtown for many years. I've now represented the whole city. Um, and, and it's not just being out there and meeting with them and talking to them, but also what can I do as mayor to try to assist them, to try to support the local downtown business. And so uh, whether it's the recognition program I talked about, whether it's a, a visitation program which actually tries to look at what are the ways that we can help them. Uh, I think that's it's, it's a combination of having a presence, being supportive, but then also trying to figure out what is it the city can do to assist you as well. So it's a combination of both the outreach, but also what can you actually do to assist us to make the business environment uh, uh, more supportive. Uh, the next question, it goes to both candidates, and it would be answered first by Mr. Bardsley, Here's the question. Major changes are underway at the Clark School. There is very little discussion to let the public know what is being planned. 
what can each of you do to get information to the public on this before a final decision is made by the school? And that's a question from uh, Mr. Bill Ames. Obviously, uh, Clark School is a uh, private property and it has private owners. But this is one of those situations, very similar to uh, the negotiations with uh, Smith and with other um, private entities in town, where I believe the mayor's office can play a very proactive role. Um, in the past, we have heard the excuse um, that the mayor's hands are tied and that there isn't a role for the mayor, they have no power or influence in that. You have the power of uh, dialogue. You have the power of conversation. Um, you're, if your hands are tied, which I don't believe, your tongue isn't tied. The, the, the mayor needs to represent, to be a vocal representative. So they could, and I don't know what has been done because as the question uh, stated, a lot of it's been, uh, private so far, but the mayors could be involved in that early on in the discussions, finding out what the plans are and contacting uh, uh, the uh, citizens and making sure that the residents know what is going on so they could have a, uh, a dialogue. Um, something I would use as a um, model, not that an ordinance is appropriate here, but I was the, uh, the counselor that moved forward the demolition delay ordinance. And that was to start the process when a, a potentially uh, historic uh, building was being uh, taken down to put a delay in there for up to a year where there could be a dialogue to see if there were other ways of protecting or preserving that, uh, that building. So that is sort of the, uh, my uh, predisposition as, as proven by an example like that. That is something that I will do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Beckwith. Yeah, the, uh, the Clark School um, is, is indeed a private property. Uh, I have actually have met with both sides of this issue uh, in, in the short time uh, since I've been acting mayor. I was approached by a group of residents who live in that neighborhood, who've uh, formed an organization to really uh, base out of their concerns about what could happen there, about potential development and the impact on the neighborhood and the historic character of the neighborhood. So I've met with them uh, to hear what their concerns are. In response to that meeting, I scheduled a meeting with the folks from Clark School to understand what their process was, what they were, uh, what they were trying to do. Uh, they were not at liberty to discuss uh, what their exact plans were because they were in negotiations with someone. But what I've tried to do throughout that process is encourage them to share information with each other because I do think that they share many of the same goals. Clark School is a historic school. It has many alumni that have great love for that property and for the historic character of that property. Clark School itself is going to remain a presence in that neighborhood. Uh, so they have an interest in keeping uh, the neighborhood uh, uh, safe and not having too much traffic and overdevelopment. And so I've tried to bring them together and, ex and have them sh have the shared values that they both share moving forward in the process. Now there's other things that are happening in terms of historic district that's being considered. Um, that's also another public process that's happening, but in terms of uh, trying to, to hear both sides of it, uh, and also trying to make uh, those folks come together and discuss some of the shared goals and shared values that they have, that's something that I believe in and it's something that I've tried to do uh, in this specific example. Okay. Now we could allot some response time if either of you would like to. We have a couple of questions on the on landfill issues, which we are going to compact. <laughs> uh, and they, they go to both candidates. The first of them is this. You both supported closing the landfill. What is your post-landfill plan? Do you plan to lead Northampton toward the zero waste alternative this opportunity provides? And with that, do you pledge to not expand the municipal landfill, and how would you like to see that land used? So this goes first to Mr. Barza. Uh, uh, David and I uh, have both um, expressed our opposition to expanding the landfill, but we did it at very different times. I did it uh, two years ago, 
Um, it seemed very evident at that time that the, the necessary work that were, what was required to expand the landfill um, in a timely manner so it wouldn't close, that had not been done. So regardless on the citizens' ref, uh, referendum, regardless of the outcome of that, the landfill was going to close anyway. So my position two years ago was let the landfill close and then institute aggressive recycling and reuse programs. And we need to re, um, see what the real hardcore waste stream of the city is. We do not have an idea of that, and we had less of a, an idea of that uh, two years ago because we all became, not all of us, some people are very aggressive recyclers, but many of us became very dependent on uh, the, uh, the landfill because it was convenient, it was cheap, and the city did not have a lot of, um, of other additional uh, recycling options because they were making money out of trash coming into the landfill. It was not in the city's best interest. So I think we need to, uh, to make sure that we have an aggressive uh, recycling programs to reduce that stream as much as possible. I do not think the uh, <coughs> landfill should be expanded over the aquifer, and I will return the waiver. Uh, Mr. Eckers. Yeah, <clears throat> the, uh, the landfill is, is closing. We're already making those preparations, and, and uh, at the beginning of, uh, of uh, 2010, uh, I was among the several counselors who were saying we need to start planning and we enacted both resolutions and an ordinance to say the landfill's closing, we really need to start planning. A task, a solid waste reduction and management task force was formed that I served on and we mapped out some short term recommendations as well as looking at some long term things that the city needed to be doing, including looking at our recycling, including looking at reuse programs. A uh, reuse committee has been formed that's been doing a lot of work. Uh, some of you may have attended the great reuse rally that was held recently where an astonishing number of uh, hard plastic and bicycles and other things were collected. Um, and so there's a group working on that. We've also tried to ramp up our composting program. And I do think zero waste is a really good goal. We had a great presentation recently here uh, from a zero waste person talking about, you may not get there, but it's an, it's an incredibly important goal to have. And many cities are coming quite close. San Francisco is diverting about 80% of its waste right now. Um, so it's an important thing for us to focus on. In terms of what we would do with the, um, with the existing landfill when it closes, uh, we've, we've had some work done by Smith College students in the engineering program to look at the feasibility of doing alternative energy on the landfill. Uh, solar is quite popular. Uh, they've looked at wind, they've looked at solar, and they've produced a report. I think that is going to be one of the things we're going to look at when it closes, when it has a chance to have the proper settling. Uh, then I do think that's a great way to move forward because uh, it would allow us to, to, in some cases, generate energy for city uses as well as revenue that we could then use to try to tackle some of these issues that we're talking about. Uh, either of you choose to uh, use some response time? Uh, just uh, quickly, I, the solar option right now is the, uh, the most attractive option that I have heard for using uh, the landfill. And so that is something that I would um, uh, support and, and push at this time. I also think that there is some part of the uh, property up there, the land up there, that could be preserved for open space and recreation. I think the citizens up there would appreciate that, could enjoy that and use that. So that is something else I would look for in, in terms of um, a reuse of the land. Mr. Yeah, I think the other thing we have to do is, uh, you know, a lot of this falls at the local level, but there's also a conversation going on at the state and national level about just how we look at product packaging, how we look at waste. Um, it's, a, it's a whole movement called the product stewardship movement, which is looking at manufacturers and trying to get them to be part of this process as well. I've been on a group of local city councilors and mayors across the state who've been lobbying uh, our state to put in place some of these frameworks. I testified earlier this year uh, at the State House for e-waste bills and for some other measures like that because uh, a lot of this we have to look at the complete waste stream 
not just what ends up at the local level that we have to dispose of, but that whole production process. Uh, trying to make products that are uh, that are less that produce less waste in the landfills, produce packaging. Uh, you know, we have a country where we have to have a tube of toothpaste, and then we have to put a box around it. Um, uh, we do things that other countries have moved away from because of trying to reduce the waste stream. So we have to act locally, but we also have to advocate for change at the state and national level on some of these policies. Thank you. Okay, this is the second part of landfill-related questions. Uh, it's to both candidates. We'll go first to Mr. Bardsley, two minutes. Over the past few years, Northampton residents who use the Glendale Road and Locust Street transfer stations have overwhelmingly supported the use of stickers to pay for their trash disposal. Yet this year, a solid waste task force with two city councilors as members voted to abolish stickers and require residents to purchase city-approved trash bags. If you were elected mayor of Northampton, would you make your decisions based on what is supported by the taxpayer or on what is proposed by some city department head or appointed an official? And that's, that's a question by Richard Kuzowski. The, um, the decision to uh, change the, uh, uh, the system for trash pits, um, I think is an example of how uh, decisions are made and implemented here that really leave people confused and angry. There was a lot of discussion at the, uh, the task force meetings. There were two very large open hearings where people came forward with various uh, ideas. Um, a lot of people uh, a, expressed a concern or a desire to stay with the present system. And now, I'm sure those on the committee had a good reason in making their recommendation. But again, there's a disconnect there. And it seemed to me what was needed is some public information uh, meetings that concentrated on that issue. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. It was one of those decisions that was made. Um, so even if it was the best decision, even if there was some sound reasoning behind that, that was never communicated to the people that, that would be impacted. And I happened to be up at the landfill at, um, or at the uh, transfer station a couple of mornings where people were um, being informed that uh, they couldn't throw their trash away, they needed a, uh, the blue bags. And there was a lot of, I think, anger and frustration that was unnecessary. So I think in terms of how we make decisions, how we listen to citizens, and how we communicate what we do um, needs to be improved. And to me, that's a classic example. Yeah, um, the, uh, the, uh, the Solid Waste Reduction and uh, Management Task Force that I mentioned earlier that was tasked with looking at the system and what we were going to do when the landfill closed or in preparation for the landfill made a series of recommendations. The number two recommendation it made was changing from the pay-as-you-throw sticker program to the pay-as-you-throw bag program. And that was a unanimous decision by the committee. Uh, we had looked at some of the research, and this gets back to the issue of recycling and how to increase recycling and how to um, be more effective about that. And, and many of the communities that we looked at that had changed to this bag program had uh, seen incredible results in terms of increased recycling. Um, and so that was the reason that we put that forward as a recommendation. In terms of the implementation, I do agree that there could have been a better job of doing better public education about it, better information. I know there were a bunch of bumps in the road because, first of all, the manufacturer who manufactured the bags, there were some glitches with the quality of the bags that had to be corrected. Um, so I do think there, was a, there could have been a better job in terms of how that information got out to people and education uh, around it. Uh, but in terms of going forward, I think the system will, will prove as we look at the recycling rates, as we look at the, uh, the revenues from the solid waste system, I think that the blue bag system, like the many other communities that have switched to it, will ultimately serve our system better in terms of increasing recycling and, and allowing people to divert more trash and do more reuse and recycling efforts. I have a follow-up. Um, stickers and bags and trash, it's like people have strong feelings about it. And no matter what you, how you, how well you try to do it, sometimes people just don't like change. 
So I guess I wanted to ask both of you, do you, you know, you have to do things that ultimately somebody's not going to like. So how do you deal with that? Uh, first, Mr. Parson. <coughs> The uh, first and foremost, again, you, you need to explain to people why the change, what the proposal is, and give them an opportunity uh, to weigh in. I think a lot of the uh, frustration and uh, anger and resentment about it is that um, they understood the old system, it worked for them, and they didn't understand why the, the new system was going uh, was brought in. Um, it may not, in some cases, it may not be an improvement for them as individuals. Uh, it may be an improvement for the entire city. But there wasn't that uh, op opportunity for that give and take. Um, I like to believe that most people are, are well-meaning and reasonable if they're given that opportunity. But if you impose something on them, then they're going to get resistant and going to get cranky. We live in a democracy. Uh, we need to communicate with our constituents. We need to give the people an opportunity to voice their concerns, even if we think we know what is best. That is our job as a, as a public servants. That's what we are, we're public servants. And so I think that is where um, uh, the, the problem was in that in the decision. If it turns out that is the right decision, I have no problem moving forward with the decision that is best. Um, but again, you don't do it um, with uh, kind of looking down at people and saying, you know, you really don't know, we're doing this, and we're not even going to, knowing that there, there's a lot of problems and questions with that decision. Um, you should recognize that and have that dialogue, have that educational effort, and that's what was missing. Yeah, uh, again, this, this was talked about when we had our public forums on the, uh, the Solid Waste Task Force. We did various options, and one of the options always included this issue of the pay as you throw back program, because there had been a long discussion about it by the DPW a couple of years earlier. They decided not to move forward with it at that time. Um, and, and so I do think it's important for people to, to get the information. I know that this is the Board of Public Works, the DPW, was trying to implement it at the time that they were renewing everyone's stickers because they felt that was the best time to give information to all the people that were customers of the transfer station uh, because actually half of our households don't use the transfer station. It's a set group of people that uh, subscribe to the transfer station. So that was the attempt I think they were trying to do was to reach those people. And yes, definitely it was a change. And I was there actually several weekends and heard from people who came up to me who were concerned about it. But I do know that, that now that it's been in place for a while, that seems to be working. I've talked to many of the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers uh, are, uh, that I've talked to like the system because they are now spending, it's more equitable. That's part of why we have the system is that it's not like everybody has different sized bags. There's one bag, we pay the price for that bag, and we pay what it costs to dispose of our trash. Um, and so for them, they are now spending a lot more time uh, helping people with recycling, helping people figure out uh, some of the bulky waste issues, some of those kinds of issues. They're not handling money like they were before. Uh, they're, they're now able to focus on those issues. And so I think, again, it's a change, but I do think that it's going to work out in the end. Thank you. And this is also a question for both candidates. Uh, to Mr. Barsley first for two minutes. Smith College has filed notice of its intention to remove or demolish two houses beside the Ford Engineering Building. If an alternative acceptable to Smith is not proposed by May, the removal will go forward. What is your take on this? Do you prefer the demolition, demolition to take place as planned, or do you prefer to engage Smith in a conversation that leads toward persuasion for an alternative? And that goes first to Mr. Barton. A uh, couple of issues here. Uh, first and foremost is the demolition delay ordinance, which has provided the opportunity for that discussion to take place. And I was, um, the, as I said earlier, I was a counselor who brought that forward, and I um, authored that with a couple of citizens in the in the community um, who had that as a concern after we lost a couple of historic buildings. The larger issue is our demolition of an entire neighborhood. Um, we used to have a very affordable neighborhood. 
where there were rental units for what I call working middle class um, individuals and families. Um, I believe lots for those uh, apartment buildings is when Ford Hall was put in. Um, a number of them have been sold and uh, Smith um, owns them and I think all eventually going to go to the way of the, uh, the two units that we talked about. I will definitely have a, um, a dialogue with Smith. I will try to see if they, there can be um, other uses of those uh, apartments or those buildings. Um, one of them in particular uh, provided uh, apartments for a lot of uh, people who were uh, coming into town new, um, and then uh, young professionals, people just out of grad school. Um, and I've known a, a lot of people, there are people in this room who have lived in those. Um, it, it really served a purpose. That whole neighborhood um, is going to be lost. There's no other neighborhood that does that uh, uh, function for housing with that neighborhood. So I will definitely uh, participate in a very uh, open and aggressive conversation and to see if there are alternatives. Thank you. Mr. Uh, yes, I, I've, uh, this is a question that's come up in several of our debates and I've heard from neighbors and that uh, residents in that neighborhood who are concerned about those buildings. They have been demolition delayed. Um, and I have actually reached out to Smith officials. Uh, we had a, a meeting last month about some other issues and I asked to have that issue on the agenda in terms of those two properties because I've heard about the concern about uh, people concerned about them being de uh, demolished. And, and the message that I gave them was to try to figure out are there people out there that may be interested in acquiring and moving those properties because that's what's typically happened in some other examples where a historic property uh, is slated for demolition and uh, we've been able to find someone or someone has stepped forward, a historic preservationist, who wants to move that property somewhere else. Um, so I have met with them, I've talked to them about this issue, and I've encouraged them to reach out. I know that they've had inquiries from some builders who've come and looked at the buildings, who've gone through them to see whether they'd be structurally sound for that. I don't know uh, what the outcome of that is, but definitely I think the, the reason for the demolition delay is to allow that time, in the case of a historic building, for finding alternatives. I don't know what the alternatives are, uh, but certainly I would, I would uh, communicate and advocate on behalf of anyone that wanted to try to, uh, to acquire those properties, to, to move them and preserve them, uh, so that they could be preserved as, as one of our many historic homes. Okay. Uh, any response time? Something? We're going to join two other questions that, that relate to the economy. Um, and I would ask you to treat this as a, as a two-part question in your, in your answers. The first asks, uh, you'll be forced to make difficult decisions with a limited budget. Which areas would you give highest priority and which would you cut? And that's referring to the municipal budget overall. The second part of the question is more specifically about schools. And it comes from Stephanie Baker. When one of you becomes mayor, per city charter you will also become chair of the school committee. Please share what your strategy will be to successfully negotiate contracts with our unions while balancing their reasonable demands with our unreasonable fiscal constraints. So the first part is, uh, what's your highest priority within the municipal budget as a whole and then specifically with the with school contract negotiations? Uh, how will you ba balance the demand? And the first, uh, that goes to Mr. Parson. For the limited budget and highest priority, the highest priority has to be with uh, need. And as was mentioned um, uh, earlier, that we have in, um, de uh, deteriorating infrastructure. So I think that's one of the things that we really have to look at within the city and, and addressing that. Um, the other, uh, another top priority has to be public safety. We need to look at the issues of um, public safety. Uh, to me, there is um, room in the whole budgeting process to have to revamp it. Um, this, uh, the mayor has all, um, almost uh, every year when she has read her uh, address to uh, the council on the budget, she talks about how the budget is the most important document of the budgeting process. 
um, is one of the most important things that city government does because it reflects its uh, priorities and it affects people directly. Um, but the budgeting uh, each year, look for this year for example, the budgeting um, hearings that the city council had, there were uh, four, five councilors at the first one and one left in the middle, so there were four for uh, a chunk of the hearings, five at the second hearing, and the joint hearing with the school committee um, for 17 minutes there wasn't a quorum, so they couldn't call the meeting. So it, it seems to me we need to open up that process, we need to look at it, and the reason for that, I think, it's not because people don't care, because it's already a done deal, and nothing important is going to come up. So we need to open up that process early on and have um, people looking at ways to, uh, uh, to change some of our priorities. And I would definitely include the employees. The employees have been left out for the most part of that process, and there's a lot of suggestions they have. Okay, Mr. Okay. Uh, so there's two, is there two questions that we're doing them separately or uh, together? Together. Okay, all right. Uh, so, in answer to the first question, I think the idea about how you set priorities is, is, um, is, is, how, you, is how you structure it the way you build that budget. Um, and one of the things I think that I would do differently uh, than the previous administration is I would try to front load the public input part of building that budget. Going out, having community meetings, having community forums. I've looked at several other models in other cities. Um, Seti Warren, who was the mayor of Newton, one of the things he did was uh, do community budget forums as he was building his budget so that his budget would be informed by hearing what the priorities were, what the values were throughout the community and he could try to reflect those in the budget. Not producing a budget then going out and saying this is my budget, what do you think? Um, I think that's a, that's a key way that we can identify what the most important priorities are. In I mean obviously the core functions that we have to provide, the key city services, our schools, our roads, our, our public safety, I mean, those are the key things that I want to make sure that we can preserve because uh, those are the things that people depend on every day. In terms of what we can eliminate, I think that there's always opportunity to figure out are there things that we're doing that are duplicative, are there things that we could do in a shared way. Uh, a few years ago, we individual departments used to buy all their own supplies. We now consolidate that and one department does all the supply buying. So I think that there are ways in the budget that we can look for those kinds of savings. In terms of the second question, which is how the mayor as chair functions with the school committee in terms of the negotiation process, and the time's getting tight, um, uh, I, I, think, I think part of the mayor's job is to be the bridge not only to the school committee, but to be the bridge to the greater community and to represent the taxpayers and to try to represent um, you know, what, the, what we can afford to do under the budget. Um, I think it's really important. I think everyone in that process, uh, teachers, school committee, mayor, all support the public schools, all want to make sure that we're providing the best education possible for our kids. And so I think that has to be the shared goal and that we have to try to figure out a way to work collaboratively to how with the resources that we have uh, can we be able to, to fund um, well-paid teachers uh, and have a strong curriculum that provides a good education. So that'll be the focus. I've run out of time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, we were coming up to our final questions here. I think we have four more. Do I have the candidates agreement to, to do a one minute response? Just some fairly specific questions so that we can uh, we can make sure that they're addressed tonight. Okay. And then we'll and then we'll we're saving uh, roughly ten minutes at the end for the closing statements. So this is a two a single single minute response time. Uh, the first of these final questions uh, follows up on that, so we have, both have a little bit more time to talk about finance. Uh, municipal finance is complex, but all citizens should grasp its basics. Explain the city's financial health to a sixth grader. <laughs> and then we'll go, in our new order of response, we will go to Mr. Narkowitz first. Okay. okay. Uh, what I would what I would uh, say to that sixth grader is that you know we've have a our our city has done very well uh, relative to other communities around in terms of being able to provide really good services, uh, not have to lay off lots of employees every year like many cities have had to do. Um, but one of the things that we have to keep an eye on is the fact that the way that we've done that 
is we've taken money out of our savings account to pay for it. Many kids have savings account, we've taught them to save, and every year we've asked them to put away money, whether it's birthday money and all that sort of stuff. Well, we have as a city have tried to save so that we would be prepared if we do have an economic downturn or if we do have emergencies that we're prepared to, to pay for them and have that savings account. One of the things I think we need to focus on in terms of our health as a city is we need to focus on how do we keep providing those services, but we also have to make sure that we're putting aside money in a savings account so that we'll be able to address those kinds of unknown concerns, whether it's snow piling up on our school roofs that have to be cleared, whether it's the boiler in this school that's failing, fine. those kinds of things. So I think that's how I would try to describe the budget and the health of it. Uh, to Mr. Barza, you have 45 seconds. You <laughs> the um, sixth graders uh, know about credit cards, they know about big ticket items, so I would explain to them in terms of going into a store and buying a, a piece of electronics on a credit card and then not having the, uh, the income to uh, keep up with the payments and that you need to have that type of a kind of, a, of the planning and the financial responsibility. Um, we have primarily an income problem and an income problem uh, creates a budgeting problem. But we really need to, to look at, at that. Um, and I'm going to jump back to the, uh, the previous questions around the schools. And yes, the negotiate, uh, negotiating with the teachers is difficult um, during these financial times. I've experienced that. But that's no, uh, you must treat the school employees with respect and dignity. That it, there's no uh, reason to uh, bully school teachers or any other employees because that creates a poor morale. You have a few more minutes, a few more seconds, 15 seconds if you'd like. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. So back to a one minute response. The next question goes to Mr. Bargley. It's from Peter Flynn. And it's to the same questions to both candidates. On May 11, the Water Department closed off half of Waitley and Conway to the public, a $300 fine for trespassing. Do you think we can find a way to protect our water without such draconian regulations and allow day hikers to enjoy this land? And it's, uh, Mr. Parson. Uh, do I know that there is a uh, solution here? No, this is the first I've heard of that. Um, will I sit down and look at what the uh, issue is and then uh, brainstorm the, uh, the possible ways of dealing with it? Yes. And to me, um, this is an opportunity to talk about uh, problem-solving skills and decision-making skills. When an issue like this is brought before me, um, I want to get all the information, I want to get the different points of view, uh, brainstorm what the possible uh, solutions are, and to try to achieve the goal that, um, for example, uh, those measures uh, we're going after, but in such a way where you're not going to be alienating people and uh, creating other problems. So um, I think you need a, a process, again, that's open-ended, inclusive, and I have no problem of making the decision that has to be made at the end of the day. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know specifically what area this is, but I do know that our, our city has uh, water supplies and as part of that, they have protected buffer lands that, that are posted to let people know that they're sensitive areas because uh, what goes on in that land, whether it's uh, ATVs or hiking or other things, or uh, could, could affect the water supply. I don't know specifically if this area, the restriction level on this area, I know that we do have uh, some, uh, some areas that are owned by, uh, by the city that are resource areas where we do allow some recreational activities to take place in a low impact way. Um, again, I'd have to understand specifically what area it is, but would certainly be happy to talk to this particular person about the area in question, what the posting is, and figure out if, if it can't be done in that particular area, if there's other, some other areas nearby that do allow those recreational opportunities. Again, trying to balance the need for public recreation, but also trying to balance the need to protect public water supplies and public health. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, question from the audience goes to Mr. Narkowitz first, and it is, how important is the Occupy Wall Street Northampton movement? Was it handled well by city officials and police? What would you have done differently? Mr. Narkowitz first. Okay. Uh, yeah, there, uh, we have had, um, there was a, a group that's uh, 
Occupy Northampton, uh, sort of part of that national movement. Um, and they have been uh, protesting on Main Street and also uh, have uh, <coughs> occupying uh, Pulaski Park or staying in Pulaski Park. Um, there was an issue that arose around uh, whether or not tents would be allowed in Pulaski Park um, and uh, long-standing rules in the, by the Board of Public Works don't allow tents or other structures to be erected. That's been a policy that we've enforced uniformly. We had a recent issue with another group that wanted to do that. My approach to it has been I've actually been working with that group. I've met with them a couple of times. I've uh, reached out to another property owner downtown. I brought them together to facilitate a meeting. And I got a response today from Occupy Northampton that they want to move forward with that um, and work with this property owner to, to do to set up tents on this property so that they can continue to have a 24-hour presence. They have been allowed to stay in the park 24 hours by the police. They just have not been allowed to erect structures there. So we've been trying to find a solution. Thank you. Mr. Barsley, that's the same question. Well, first of all, I think the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement and, and therefore Occupy Northampton and all the other uh, movements that were uh, started nationwide are hugely important. And I think if people are expressing uh, their frustration <coughs> with uh, big businesses and how um, uh, corporate greed is having a uh, severe impact on the working middle class. As a, people are expressing their anger in, in a very uh, a different way because how people have expressed um, anger in the past and some other political movements. So I think it's hugely uh, significant. Um, in terms of uh, Occupy uh, Northampton, um, there was uh, some miscommunication apparently. They were definitely told they had to leave the park, um, that there was no structures and no sleeping. There is a, a police report where that is documented. So you can find that, I've read it. And so um, it should have been handled as well. Okay, next question. Uh, again, one minute response it goes to Mr. Barsley first. Would you extend the hours of the cot shelter past noon for the homeless on bitterly cold winter days and hot and humid summer days? The question comes from Joyce Saving Russia. Uh, yes, I will work to extend those hours. We have had incidents in the past where people have uh, left and during uh, very severe weather. Um, there was one incident uh, last year, I believe, where a woman in a wheelchair was stuck on a hill um, outside of uh, the, uh, one of the, those shelters um, and couldn't move until a motorist came by and had a, a rescue her. Um, so uh, it is really problematic, um, I think, to um, be putting uh, people out in very severe weather. We need to address that. And I will sit down with the, uh, the agencies involved to see what uh, recourse we can have, what are our options. Mr. Douglas. Yeah, the, uh, the cot shelter is op operated by a, by a private group, by a faith group that, that does that work. I don't know the rationale for the closing time, but certainly this issue of extreme temperatures, uh, whether it's heat or cold, is an issue. Um, I know the city has operated you know, cooling centers and warming centers in some of those extreme cases. Um, I don't understand, I don't know the specifics of why that group has that policy. We certainly reach out to them to try to understand it. I don't think the mayor has the ability to you know, unilaterally declare something. I'd want to work cooperatively with that group and understand the policy and, and, and see if we can figure out a way to address the concern within the limits of what they're trying to do as a, as a nonprofit providing a vital service to the community. Okay, thank you. Well, this will be the final question uh, from the audience, and then we'll move into the closing statements. And it goes first to Mr. Narkowitz. Uh, up on, uh, on Hospital Hill, the former Hospital Hill, there's an ongoing project that involves construction of new single-family houses and duplexes. Do you feel that the process of building these homes is open enough and that all builders have had an equal opportunity to be part of this. And that's first to Mr. Marcos. Yeah, the, um, the, the developer for that project is Mass Development, which is a quasi-public organization that, uh, that acquired the property when the state surplused it. So they're the primary developer. 
Um, they've been working actually uh, with a number of different builders at different phases of the project. Uh, they've worked with the community builders on, uh, on rehabbing some of the apartments to create apartment buildings. They've worked with our own Wright builders here locally to create some green, uh, both single family homes and townhouses. They recently um, uh, made an arrangement with Agora Builders, which is a, a, a I think they're at, I'm not sure where they're located, but they're now building some modular homes. And then more recently, uh, I think Pequoy Builders, which is also somewhere in the Springfield area, has been awarded um, uh, to, to do another phase of, of uh, smaller cottage style homes. So they have their process that they use. They do have to do public RFPs for road construction, for um, other services, but in terms That's of selling good. land, they are the ones that are doing it and they're trying to use a variety of builders for that process. Thank you. Mr. Barzik? Uh, yes, uh, Ho Hospital Hill or Village Hill is one of those uh, public-private uh, uh, partnerships uh, that, that can uh, present some uh, challenges and even problems. Um, if, on the last time I looked at the website, uh, there were identified uh, two private partners. And there was one realtor uh, listed and one builder. Um, I don't know how, what the process was to select those two, uh, but I, it does create a lot of questions uh, within um, members of the, uh, the community about how that happened. And um, since it is a public-private partnership, um, I, I think it is incumbent upon the city to make very, very clear how those type of decisions are made because um, it, it really creates a feeling of uh, mistrust for some. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, closing statements. Uh, we tossed a coin, as I said earlier, and the first to deliver the closing statement will be Mr. Martin. And uh, both candidates have two minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Gazette and WHMP and Northampton Media for uh, putting together WHMP for putting together this event, and thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. I also want to say a thank you to my wife, Yelena, and our daughters, Emma and Zoe, uh, for their love and support throughout this campaign. Northampton is an excellent place to live, to learn, to work, to run a business, and to raise a family. I'm running for mayor because I want to keep Northampton strong, and I want to make it better. During my three terms on the city council, I've been a positive and productive representative and leader. I've never shied away from tough issues or hard work. I brought people together to create innovative solutions and tangible results to improve our community. Since announcing my candidacy, I've knocked on hundreds of doors and sat in dozens of living rooms and kitchens across our city, listening and sharing my ideas and vision for how we can create economic opportunity and jobs, keep our city livable and affordable, maintain strong public schools, deliver smart and cost-effective city services, protect our environment and keep Northampton green and sustainable, foster active neighborhood and citizen participation, and lead a government that is open, fair, and transparent. This election is a critical one for our city and presents a stark choice. There will always be real disagreements. The question is, how do we resolve them? Are we going to focus on the past, dwelling on old fights and differences, or do we choose to look forward talk about the future of our city, and decide how to work together to reach our shared goals. Northampton needs a mayor with a positive vision and a steady proven track record of leadership and results. A mayor who will unite our city and work hard every day for all of its people to find innovative solutions to the challenges we face. I am the candidate with the experience, the ideas, the energy, and the commitment to offer a new generation of leadership to move our great city forward. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I hope I can earn your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Mr. Parson. I also wish to thank the Gazette, WHNP, and Northampton Media for sponsoring and organizing tonight's uh, debate. Uh, for the first time in 12 years, the position of mayor of Northampton is vacant. You, the voters, have the responsibility of hiring a new mayor on November 8th. I am clearly the candidate with the strongest resume. I am the candidate with the outstanding career experience. I am the candidate with the superior record of demonstrated leadership. I am the candidate who has discussed the issues that are shaping our community, 
and I am the candidate who has offered thoughts about our future challenges. Compare the information in our campaign brochures. Each of these are very reflective of who we are and what we believe in. In order to highlight my thinking about our future, I will use this weekend storm as a metaphor. In a nutshell, an atypical or unusual event severely impacted our normal daily routines and forced us all out of our comfort zones. With an unstable national economy severely impacting the working middle class, and with the threat of a number of potential environmental issues facing us, I believe it is reasonable to assume we will be facing a number of atypical events in our future. This requires our leaders though, to have the wisdom and courage and creativity to figure out how to do things differently. I am the candidate best equipped to face the future challenges. I ask you for your vote on November 8th. Thank you. I'd like to offer thanks to the candidates, uh, to members of the audience for questions and their participation here, to the staff of NCTV for their great service. And our best wishes go out to all those in our area who are still without power. Don't forget to vote next Tuesday. Okay. So, um...